AI rapidly evolves, the world is trying to play catch up. One of the sectors that is bracing for impact due to AI is the workforce. The co-founder of LinkedIn is predicting the demise of the so-called 9-to-5 job and the rise of contractual work in the next decade. Let's discuss this with Jonathan Yabut, founder and managing director of JY Consultancy and Ventures. Uh, so I'd like to get your comments regarding the predictions of LinkedIn co-founder uh, predicting the demise of the so-called 9-to-5 job and the rise of contractual work in the next decade. Do you agree with his prediction? Yes and no. So first and foremost, I think Hoffman said this not in absolutist terms. So I think he's referring to certain jobs and positions that are more linear and more project-based. So if you ask me, can someone who's been formerly doing a poster for a workshop be replaced by Canva? I think the answer is yes. I myself can attest to that. I had five social media designers before in my business, and I had to let go of some people because I thought it was more cost efficient for me to use Canva on my own because for one push of a button, that can be done. However, I do think that for certain senior leadership and management positions, companies are still going to be smart enough to not let go of their people and rely purely on contractual work. And the reason for that is because we all know that we can attribute success of companies to culture and sharing of values. You don't want people to just come and go and not be emotionally invested to the business. You want people who are going to be there for the long run. So when it comes to strategic thinking, uh, arts, or let's say, for example, talent management, I don't think that AI is going to replace any of these. And more importantly, I don't think that companies will prioritize profits with getting contractual folks versus getting people who are going to be there for the long run. I, I'm just kind of surprised when you talked about the arts because you would think that is something that cannot be, I guess, automated, but mm. you have mentioned that you, mm. know, you were able to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's right. So maybe I think when people think of arts, they think of, let's say, creating a painting or let's say creating a poster. So those are the kinds of arts that can have certain patterns. But talking to people is also part of art. Like winning a relationship, if you happen to be a sales uh, agent, selling insurance or real estate, these are examples of art wherein people want to feel special. You know, They want someone to talk to them, show them around the property. And I think it's going to take a while until people will feel comfortable that they're talking to a robot or they're talking to a chatbot selling them these items. So aside from from the arts, as you had mentioned, like what other sectors will be impacted the most by this? Uh, a lot. So anything that involves manual computations, anything that involves routine work, so something that is repetitive. And the reason for that is because AI is based on algorithms. If you can predict that X is going to lead to Y, there is always going to be a language that can be coded for that. So to give you an example... Um, banking in the 1950s, 1940s became repetitive. You have someone depositing, you have someone withdrawing, someone asking for a loan. And so easily ATMs was able to replace that. So anything that involves something that is repetitive and can be pre-programmed in advance will definitely be affected by artificial intelligence. So a lot of jobs, actually, if you think about it. A, a lot of jobs. Um, if there's anything that I would make a very like strong exemption, it will be anything that involves more complex thinking that cannot be pre-programmed. Mm -hmm. So for example, leadership is going to be hard to be eradicated by AI because it involves both logic, but also emotion. So simple things such as, I want to understand why my employee is always late. That can't be something that an artificial intelligence can simply identify and manage on their own. You know, you have to be like responsive as well. And it's not just a cookie cutter, you know, response. Yeah. You know, you have to get cues as well. That's right. That's right. April, if I may also add, notice that five years ago, chatbots were a very important deal for a lot of companies. And up until today, it has become a dominant way of managing your customer service to cut on costs and to also make it accurate somehow. But notice that a lot of companies these days are cutting back on that. In fact, the high-end and premium companies are shifting back into human customer service. And the reason for that is because there is really a big difference when someone understands your question. Plus, if you're complaining, a level of compassion still needs to be there. And unfortunately, artificial intelligence may not be able to relate on that side. 
So how do you think Filipino workers feel about AI? Do they feel threatened or, you know, are they more like, well, you know, this is an opportunity for us because as workers, AI can actually make us more efficient and better and focus on what matters most. I think in general, when you look at employees, especially from the Gen Z and Gen Y, the general sentiment is being threatened. And the reason for that is because the positions and roles that these people hold today are more project-based. So when you look at, for example, the BPO industry in the Philippines, a lot of this, whether it's voice-based or non-voice-based, can be very repetitive. A lot of freelancers and virtual assistants in the Philippines, uh, their job is to create posters. Their job is to create videos. Their job is to proofread, whether it's medical underwriting or whether it's uh, someone's novel from someone in the United States, for example. Definitely, these things in the next five years can be so... the. the Artificial intelligence technology can be so good that they can simulate what a human being does. And I need to highlight that this technology are not really that uh, new. If you look at examples of Canva and Grammarly, Grammarly is used for improving your grammar and your writing. People think that they're new, but they've been there for almost 10 years now. It just so happened that they become more dominant and popular because there are more people who are using it in the Philippines. But in the other parts of the world, they've been dominant for quite a while. So I can totally sympathize because there will be people who may lose their jobs or who may lose clients because of this technology. And of course, I'm going to make a disclaimer here. If I go back to the example of the ATMs, when ATMs came in, it threatened a lot of tellers. But at some point, creativity of humanity changed. When tellers were replaced by ATMs, it gave us a lot of time to think of new products and services. So we were able to create more creative bank loans. We were able to create insurance. The debit card got also uh, improved with a plastic credit card. So what I'm trying to say here is that even if certain jobs get taken away by artificial intelligence, there's a level of human creativity that allows us to catch up and create new industries, create new jobs in the future. So, you know, that said, I'm just curious about your thoughts about the gig economy, which is uh, right now flourishing. Um, do you think that uh, we can continue to see it grow further in the future, even with AI? I think so. I think even if I mentioned a while ago that it can threaten certain people, it will augment still a lot of them. The gift that AI gave us is time. If you hire a social media graphic designer five years ago, it might take them two hours or three hours to create a poster. Now, if you give the same job to another designer, it can only take them 30 minutes or one hour, for example. So my point also here is I don't think that AI is generally going to replace a lot of freelancers. However, if you're that type of freelancer who does not know how to use AI, you might not be in the priority list of other clients who want to get someone who's more technologically abreast. So do you have any recommendations to the government um, as to how it can ride the AI wave and actually take advantage of it? You're reading my mind, April, when you yeah. ask that question. This is yeah. where the government definitely needs to intervene because unfortunately, there's going to be a digital divide. When you look at people in Metro Manila, where an internet connection is much more stable, and when you look at people who are, you know, in every day of their life, they use technology, they're definitely going to be prioritized to be employed compared to someone who might be in a far-flung province where internet connection is also bad. Plus, you know, technologies aren't as widely used as well. So I think the government needs to invest outside Metro Manila, not just internet infrastructure, but integrating it into the curriculum of their students. So understanding how artificial intelligence works, and including as well how ethics is affected by artificial intelligence, understanding when someone when something is created organically and when something is created through the human mind. Those things, um, I'm concerned because I haven't seen any proper bill or ordinance that has been taken even from the Department of Education. I'm sure that they are aware of it, but I'm also hopeful that someone is going to step up to involve that part. Yeah, I think uh, the government is trying to work on it, but you know, uh, maybe they should work on it faster uh, That's because right. those are priorities, especially for our Filipino workers. Uh, you right. know, uh, looking to become relevant still in the next decade or so. 
Okay. So with that, thank you very much for your thoughts, uh, Jonathan, on AI and, you know, how uh, we can take advantage of it uh, for the Filipinos and for economic growth. Thank you so much.